my name is Larry Wallace. Um, I'm a former president of the ILA. I'm also president of College of Syntonic Optometry for 14 years. Um, I'm involved in vision therapy. Uh, I teach uh, syntonic phototherapy all around the world. In fact, we just came from doing a course in Spain. Um, I've also been involved in electromedicine. I'm, uh, I, I patented and invented the first device in the US to use microcurrent uh, devices to treat eye disease. And uh, so involved in many different kinds of energy medicine. I'm gonna talk today um, about a, a recent uh, experiment that I did, and it's all based on vision therapy. It's based on syntonic phototherapy. So as a way of introduction, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this uh, syntonic th therapy involves putting light into the eye, and it's, uh, the basis of the therapy is to balance the autonomic nervous system. So we know that color therapy uh, directly uh, gets into our bodies through our skin, our acupuncture points, and especially our eyes. And uh, the communication channel seems to be organized around the autonomic nervous system. So there's uh, feed forward, feed backward systems that use photons as a major communication vehicle and in, used in healing. So uh, in terms of syntonics, we use uh, the, ANS, the autonomic nervous system as the major regulatory uh, system for the mind and body homeostasis. Uh, it's based on using light frequencies of certain combinations to balance the autonomic nervous system and treat vision problems as their source. So we view vision problems such as eye coordination, uh, focusing problems, peripheral vision, especially peripheral vision and depth perception as imbalances in the autonomic nervous system. And so these vision problems that we have are just symptoms of these imbalances. So we try to treat them, treat the visual problems at their source by putting light into the eye of specific frequencies. So we regulate the sensory part of our vision system and the motor output of the system through uh, stimulating and, and uh, kind of inhibiting both the thalamus of the brain and the hypothalamus, so where there are direct connections from the eye into the middle of your brain. So the two branches of the autonomic nervous system, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the sympathetic system, which arouses us and causes uh, fight and flight reflexes, and the parasympathetic, which is more the visceral in, internal system, which inhibits or dampens down the sympathetic system. Uh, there's a reciprocal innervation between uh, all the hormones of our body and the autonomic nervous system uh, through neurochemical pathways, energetic pathways, and the interaction of our internal environment and our external environment uh, has to be balanced to create homeostasis or balance within our nervous system and our physiology in general. So in syntonics, we use... Uh, combinations of colors, but on the red end of the spectrum, we use red to stimulate or activate the sympathetic nervous system, and all the way to the other end, violet to activate the parasympathetic system. And each of these have certain reflexes in the eye and certain effects on, on the visual system. And green is the balancer. Uh, and so this balance board model has been used for many years, and uh, one of the th things I'm gonna talk about in fact, one of the major points I'm going to talk about is that the autonomic nervous system is much more complex than this, and we're going to, we've been trying to understand that complexity by measuring the pupils, and we're going to use the, a new kind of technology that we'll talk about after we're going to take turns, uh, how the pupil can give us immediate real-time uh, information about the autonomic nervous system, and then we can start to unravel some of the complexity of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, there's all these pathways of light through the eye. Uh, there's, it's incredibly complex. Uh, the light goes through your eyes and goes almost everywhere and uh, affects all these, these different pathways. So um, again, this balance board system was used to kind of build or discharge energy to create homeostasis in the autonomic nervous system. And so it, as a way of just exposing a little more complexity of this autonomic nervous system, uh, we're just going to go over a few of the points. Like one is that the, the, it isn't always you stimulate sympathetic and that changes parasympathetic or blue colors of parasympathetic bring up 
uh, redampen or reduce uh, the red end or sympathetic part of our nervous system, but there are all these other uh, overlays of the neurological system, one of which is that uh, there's unilateral uh, activation of the nervous system. Uh, one of the best examples is the polyvagal theory, which is the vagus nerve can shut down the sympathetic nervous system without any activation of the sympathetic nervous system. We also have isolated or sequestered reactions within the nervous system, and we also can be hyperactivated or hyperinhibited of both these parts of our autonomic nervous system. So uh, an example of the unilateral is that the polyvagal, the vagus nerve, can initiate parasympathetic action in our, to regulate our heart, our respiration, our emotions our reactivity uh, to social engagement, uh, the way we listen, the way our facial muscles work, um, all without opposition of the nervous system. So for instance, uh, I may go down the street and see somebody coming and I feel a little bit threatened by that person and automatically the sympathetic makes me get, could make me go into a fight or flight state. But the, para, the vagus system can also make, can just override that initial reflex and just make me relax, relax my facial muscles, change the inner he hearing, the frequencies of my uh, auditory uh, sensory input, and I can approach that person and feel relaxed and smile, and all of a sudden there's a social engagement that's occurred without having that fight or flight reaction. The vagus system allows this kind of attachment and the kind of, on a social interaction without uh, being, having to shut down and become all aroused to begin with. So uh, there's also all kinds of reactions of the autonomic nervous system in the body. Like sympathetic arousal builds charge in our body. It's got to be released uh, or opposed by the parasympathetic. So the way we protect ourselves in sympathetic things that would make us really f into these fight or flight states is we internalize uh, a lot of the stress in our muscles. And so we have muscle tension. And if we have too much of it, it inhibits our breathing our venous circulation, uh, it shuts down our emotional responses, leads to anxiety, fear, uh, anger. And if we're too over parasympathetic, if the system is constantly trying to depress itself, we get depressed, we lack muscle tone, our muscles become flaccid instead of overstimulated. We see this a lot as an eye doctor, which is what I am, uh, in the eye as tension or in either from acute or chronic stimulation of part of the nervous system. We see the muscles are underactive, the eyes can't coordinate, or they're overactive, and they're all tense and held together, affecting all kinds of other things like reading and learning and visual processing. So the autonomic nervous system can become under discontrol, and that by splitting off different reflexes, uh, becoming very unstable, so stimuli from our environment make us uh, overactive or underactive. We overreact or we underreact. Uh, we can always we can feel a sense of where the world is overwhelming us, and so we become very antagonistic and we meet the world more with anger and more with resistance. So we can be hyperactive, or we can be depressed. Uh, these are all examples of uh, autonomic nervous system discontrol. So in an in example of this in, in terms of hyperactivation is especially if we have um, injury, uh, head injury. And in our practice in Ithaca, New York, we see uh, head injury patients, uh, stroke, trauma, uh, athletic uh, concussions. We see them almost every day. And we treat, we're specialists in treating these kind of uh, neural rehabilitation cases. And, um, a lot of these injuries come from concussions to the front part of the, uh, the front part of the head, which comes from whiplash or contra coup when you go forward. Also, when you have uh, your your front frontal cortex of your brain is very susceptible to injury, and when that happens, it affects uh, all the limbic pathways in our more pri primal parts of our brain, and it can break down our immunity. Our peripheral vision shrinks down. Uh, our brain lacks coherence, clear thinking. We lose the ability to remember things from both the environment and implicit memory inside of us. There's a disruption from the frontal part of our brain to the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. That is that all the light coming from the front of our brain 
is constantly coordinated with the adrenals and the midbrain, the hypothalamus, and that's where emotions lie. So uh, this man, Alan Shore, wrote The Neurobiology of Emotion, and he goes into it with tremendous depth. And it's, uh, if you're interested in this kind of aspect, it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, book in, in, in regards to this. Uh, when we have hyperactive responses, we lose the ability to, to react to stimuli without excessive re, uh, actions, pain, numbness, uh, attention deficit. Uh, we, can't, we can't coordinate our senses and our motor system. And uh, we use light therapy to try to restore all this balance. And the way we do it is, is mostly by giving sympathetic colors if we're underactive or parasympathetic colors if we're overactive. But now we're finding to really heal and to take it to a higher level, it's much more complex than this. Uh, just a, a new model uh, is, uh, of the autonomics has been developed by uh, Dr. Krakow from Russia, elaborated by Dr. Hewing in England, that shows uh, that uh, they come up with a technology that reads your color vision. And that all defects in your body uh, affect the way you perceive color. And uh, the visual perception, the reactions uh, within the body to color cause different reactions to occur in the proteins and the DNA expression. And uh, when this happens, you have uh, a whole imbalance in your system in terms of the biophoton communication system, which we've talked about at previous ILA conferences, that one of the major communication systems within our body is through biophotons. And, uh, when the biophoton com uh, communication breaks down, you lose color perception. And what they do is, by reading the way you see color, they, they can analyze uh, through elaborate algorithms your blood, glucose levels, blood pressure, temperature, sleep, acidity, digestion, osmotic pressure, even your posture. And uh, through these scans, they then feed color back to you, and they're treating over 100 different conditions reading the, from your color vision. So, I won't go into the biophotons, but uh, there we are, uh, a being of constant light input and output. And what this, 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 what this new theory of virtual scanning is saying, that the way we perceive the world is a lot um, dependent on internal physiology. Our internal physiology actually changes the way we see color and the way we perceive the world. But then we can take the way we perceive the world and feed it back into our bodies and then change the internal physiology. Very, very profound uh, thinking. So I think that's my, my beginning. Now I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about how we actually measure the autonomic nervous system through this new technology and show the different layers and how we're using it now to treat uh, in a much more uh, elaborate way. So I'm going to turn this over now to Anadi for his for first sure. section. Yeah. So the, the label mark. We thought it would be more dynamic if we alternate. So we each of us present you some uh, different point of views on the latest discoveries in research related to light therapy. And uh, you're getting a double president package. <laughs> and Larry didn't mention that he was our previous ILA president. So. I'm going to move on with uh, other aspects of uh, recent research. Now, the, most of the scientific research having to do with light is, of course, focused on the biophysical aspects of it, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier. It's the main area of scientific research, so this is where really a lot of the action is happening now. And there are two main uh, research areas in this biophysical um, influence of light. The first one is photobiomodulation, which is a process where as light um, activates uh, cellular metabolism. And we'll have uh, Professor Caru herself talking about this tomorrow, so I won't go into it now. But it's one of the major ways in which uh, we know that light um, heals and energizes uh, cellular processes. The second great area where there's a lot of research going on is um, in relation with the non-visual optic pathway. Most of you are probably familiar with that. I'll just briefly um, summarize what this is for those of you who are not so familiar. The, um, we all know, of course, that light 
uh, forms vision. There's the optic nerve linking the retina with the um, back part of the brain, the visual centers of the brain visual processing that creates vision and it's really the main way in which we interact with light. But we now know that there's a second very important system linking um, the retina not with the visual processing centers but with the very core of the brain, the hypothalamus. And through this uh, alternate nervous pathway which is called the non-visual optic pathway because it, it's not related to our vision sense but it's another way in which light acts on us. So this non-visual optic pathway um, has a direct influence on the very core of the brain. This is the area where all our hormonal balance and the autonom autonomic nervous system balance is controlled. So this explains uh, a lot of the profound influence of light on us, totally independent from vision itself. And uh, there's tremendous amount of research um, happening there because we're starting to realize how profound the influence of light is in that respect. It affects all kinds of uh, um, structures at the core of the brain and uh, it has implications at many levels. For example, chronobiology, our uh, daily rhythm, circadian rhythm is controlled by this. And again, we have um, this afternoon, one of the experts in the field, uh, um, Abraham Ayn, will be talking about it, so I will not go in much depth here. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of research going on now, but it's been known for quite a while that there is this link um, between the um, light and um, core processing in the brain separate from vision already uh, in 48, uh, Professor Holwich had um, detected this and he, he called it the energetic pathway to distinguish it from the visual pathway of the optical nerve. But it took quite a while before it became clear how this works. There were hints that there was such a process, but um, it's only in recent years that it's been clarified and this explains why there is so much more research going on because once it became clear what's involved, uh, lots of other people are getting interested. And it started around the year 2000 where um, the um, a new um, light sensor was discovered in the retina uh, because we are, of course vision is based on rods and cones, these cells in the retina that allow us to see and they've been known for quite a while. But now they discovered around 2000 that there was another receptor, a kind of opsin, which is a receptor that's closer to what uh, invertebrate uh, animals use for, for light sensitivity. And it was found that we actually have some of this in our retinas as well, so already it gave a hint that there was a new kind of light sensing that was not so well known. And um, then a little later on, in 2002, um, it was finally found out that some of our cells, ganglionic cells, uh, have this uh, opsin uh, uh, receptor, melanopsin uh, specifically, and it was found through uh, actual tracing back of the nerves from the hypothalamus back to the retina where these ganglions are. <clears throat> and a um, pretty long name was given to those cells, the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, IPRGCs, and uh, so these cells are spread throughout the retina and, uh, and there's not that many of them. It's about 1 to 3% of the ganglionic cells have this melanopsin expression and so are sensitive to light on their own. You can see here the kind of microelectrodes that are used to uh, measure what's happening in those ganglionic cells. And uh, it's at the micrometer scale here. So there's a lot of research going on to what's happening there through those, um, this whole visual system in the retina that was completely unknown until just 10, 15 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> the next major uh, discovery came from Dr. Brainerd who uh, identified the exact um, action spectrum that acts on these 
uh, cells and these uh, melanopsin cells. And he found that it's in the deep blue region. Um, so the blue light is what activates this whole system, driving our hypothalamus. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is uh, the retinal structure. Light comes in from the bottom side here. <clears throat> and you have this whole layer of ganglionic cells <clears throat> that are linked to the optic nerve. <clears throat> And in the back of this are the actual cones and rods of our vision. And a few of those ganglionic cells are the intrinsically photosensitive ones. And these are the ones that activate this uh, non-optic pathway. And, and we now know that it's a very complex system. We, we're only barely starting to understand the complexity of this thing. And this is what I'm uh, going to show you uh, just now. But these cells are <coughs> relay signals from the rods and cones, so they're all linked um, and somehow mixed in these ganglion cells. And from there, the, the nervous signals are sent to the optic nerve. So there's a whole processing happening here. Um, and so in the past 10 years, a lot has been uh, discovered. And People thought they were starting to have a, a proper handle on this. And uh, actually, very recently, the main researchers who were responsible for these first 10 years of discoveries uh, came together and published an article um, just last January. And this is uh, um, one of the major um, events happening in this field. That's why I wanted to point it out. And they, they published an, uh, an article called uh, too fast, measuring and using light in the melanopsin age. Because uh, it, it's true that now that we know this um, melanopsin sensitivity to light, this whole new uh, non-visual optic pathway, it, it, it means that many uh, uh, profound things um, will come out of it. And the important thing is that it's much more complex than we, we think. Like we, they, they've tried to simplify it in the first 10 years when the discoveries were coming up. And these people came together last year and um, published this and showing that there are many aspects um, where things are happening that we didn't suspect at first. And what this leads to is that it's too early to draw uh, simple conclusions from all this which many researchers, especially in the lighting industry, have a tendency to do. Um, so what they showed, for example, is that there's um, not only a frequency-driven <clears throat> aspect, it's not only the wavelength of light that will differentially influence this system, meaning that different colors will have different effects. It's also temporal-driven. The, um, these uh, melanopsin cells react much more slowly than uh, the rods and cones of our vision. So, and you have a mix of those two influences happening together. So many of the, the fast influence comes from the visual system, and slow influences come from the um, IPRGCs, and they mix together. So you have, depending on the speed of reaction of uh, light uh, stimulus, you'll have different delayed reactions. And this, of course, brings in all kinds of uh, complexities in this uh, sophisticated system, and you, which means in many cases you cannot draw obvious conclusions. <clears throat> and they also point out that each of these sensors, the rod cones and the RPRGCs, respond to different spectra. So you, you really have to take into account the different time reactions of each and the different uh, um, intensity reaction of each. So as you can see, you end up with a very uh, complex system if you try to analyze all this. So this suggests, for example, that we should have five different units of uh, measuring light instead of a single one that's used by the, the light designers now, the photopic uh, response. If you want to really understand the system, we have to have five different um, uh, systems. And so the basic conclusion is that 
it's not yet possible to predict the non-image forming impact of a given illuminant based on its intensity and spectral composition. So basically, uh, you cannot draw simple conclusions, and this is addressed specifically at the lighting industry. And uh, they, there was a whole controversy happening this year uh, from that article. So you can see blogs and people from the, the various departments of, uh, for example, here the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy trying to react to this, and uh, especially the LED industry, which is, uh, of course, um, a major revolution happening in lighting. Now all the lighting is switching from incandescent towards LED, and the LED light is uh, uh, very different from the incandescent light. The spectrum is different, the, uh, um, and so obviously, they're extremely interested in what that means. And <clears throat> the, again, they're trying to moderate what that means. So they, they say, OK, it's true. We cannot draw uh, simple conclusions. Um, but we have to live with it for now. So there's really an ongoing controversy, which is quite fascinating and, and uh, interesting to see. And many people from the ILA are involved in that in the sense that there's many aspects that the industry is not necessarily aware of, of the impact of subtler details of light on our health. And um, for example, Alexander Wunsch will be talking uh, specifically about this in his presentation in a couple of days. <clears throat> um, yeah, so for example, some of the new things, the, these IPRGCs, when they were discovered, they were already quite uh, um, amazing to see that there was this new light receptors that was unknown, but now they're finding out that there's actually many different kinds. At, uh, up to last year, they had identified five different kinds of those cells, and each have a different function and a different action spectra. So again, you can see that we're only starting to unravel this very complex structure. There's a lot of things to be discovered about vision and, and our uh, sensitivity to light. And they're finding out that these cells not only affect the uh, um, hypothalamus and things like uh, um, circadian rhythm and so on, but they also are involved in our um, vision perception in some aspects. So there's, a, again, an interlink between the visual and the non-visual system that's only starting to be understood. And um, this was another interesting uh, recent research where they showed that um, through brain scan, you can see the impact of light, how it activates brain functions. And so, of course, through the, this non-visual optic pathway, you first activate the, the core, the hypothalamus. But if you wait for a few minutes, after 20 minutes, this influence has spread out throughout the whole uh, brain, including the frontal cortex. So again, it goes to show that there is a constant interaction between this non-visual and visual system within us. And to try to separate them and simplify it is not um, an accurate representation. Things that are evolving also, for example, the action spectra of this non-visual optic system has shifted. When it was discovered in 2001, um, it was considered to be focused on, on deeper blue, and now they're finding that uh, through more detailed analysis, it's actually more shifted towards the, the green part of the spectrum. So now it's 490 nanometers that's considered to be the peak of action of this uh, non-visual spectrum. And again, an other recent research is showing that uh, there are added complexities. Um, even the impact of this blue light on us, um, again, we're finding that it's not only blue light, even the green at 555 nanometers has a direct impact, for example, on, on melatonin suppression and circadian rhythm. But it only has an impact for a short time. After an, uh, an hour or so, it stops acting, whereas the blue light continues acting. So it's again this temporal shift between the different systems. But it goes to show that for SAD um, treatment, for example, it's all focused on blue light, but it may very, very well be that green light is as effective and has the added advantage of not um, having uh, problems with the blue light hazard, the, the um, damaging the retina through uh, higher energy photons. 
So it's a very interesting uh, uh, development step in this field. <coughs> and um, I'll finish my turn here um, by another extremely fascinating research that just came out a couple of months ago from a group uh, in Israel um, that addressed the fact, the, the, the mysterious fact, actually, if you look at the retinal structure, the sensitive cells that are at the back of the structure, light enters here from the bottom. So it seems very illogical that you, you would filter out of the very back there. So for a long time, it's been thought that this was just an error of nature somehow, as it happens, like with the appendix that does, shouldn't be there, has no purpose. Maybe nature got mixed up and made the retina upside down. So, as we can guess, it's not, probably not the case. And this recent discovery is fascinating because it, they found that actually this old structure here is a kind of optic fiber and focuses light on the back here at specific points that optimize the whole vision system. So in fact, what was thought to be a fluke and an error of nature is uh, entirely different. It's actually a highly optimized system to uh, um, extract as much light as possible from uh, the environment and increase uh, the sensitivity of our lighting uh, uh, detection. So this is really fascinating to see that, uh, um, again, things that we take for granted are, are being challenged um, as we speak. Okay, back to you, Larry. Thank you so much. So yeah, the complexity goes on. So um, as I was saying, the complexity of the autonomic nervous system. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was trying to demonstrate with some of the examples I gave before, but. Uh, One of the ways we can see the effects of this, uh, the complexity is through the pupils of the eye. Now there's two main technologies that read the autonomic nervous system in real time. One is uh, heart rate variability, which measures the, the, the uh, coherence of the heartbeat, which you can measure in real time to see which part of the nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic, is more active or underactive or imbalanced. Uh, the other way is through the pupil. The pupil is the most sophisticated electronic scanner ever um, imagined. It's constantly letting the light in at different rates and letting light out at different rates. And in syntonic optometry, we use the pupil as one of our major diagnostic uh, criteria. We look at the pupil and we see how it responds to light, how does it hold constriction, how does it open, and we use that as a diagnosis of what's going on in the nervous system. Uh, now, there's new technology called uh, rapid uh, afferent pupil uh, diagnosis. Uh, this is an electronic device through infrared light measures what happens to the pupils in incredible detail. And it, can, it gives a graph of what's called pupillography. You can see what any stimulus does to the light and then how does the pupil respond to the light. And, uh, what it does is it presents different, uh, allows you to present different stimuli. We can present uh, white light at different sizes. We can put light into different quadrants of the eye, uh, but we also can test it for red, green, blue, and yellow of different sizes. So it's a way of seeing how our nervous system responds directly to light input into the eye. And what it does is it shows if there's an, uh, a reduction in the pupil reflex, that's called an afferent pupil defect, that is the light comes in, but the pupil doesn't shut down, it opens up again. And the more this defect uh, occurs, the, they call it a defect, but the stronger the response is for the pupil reopening gives a logarithmic number. The higher the number, it means the higher uh, that, or not higher, but the less the pupil responded to that stimuli. So it allows us to present uh, all these different stimuli. We can use it for eye disease, for glaucoma. It tells us whether the problems in the nervous system are neurological or circulatory. We can di diagnose the efficacy of therapy. Um, we can diagnose how it affects our peripheral vision. 
But the way I was, what I was most interested in, does it tell us something about our receptivity to color? So uh, as an example, this person came in and they were uh, severely depressed. Uh, they had SAD, they were taking no medications and uh, they were feeling really uh, totally fatigued and run down. When we measured their pupil, uh, the, the higher the number, the more the defect. Zero would be perfect. This person had a 0.28 for, uh, for white. Uh, and then when these higher numbers indicate these colors, blue and yellow, were high numbers that meant that their nervous system did not respond well to those colors. So we gave them those colors. We gave this person a treatment of, uh, of something called uh, Delta Omega, which is a yellow indigo color combination. And after just a couple of treatments, the depression totally lifted. Um, he felt and his energy returned. He had a totally different outlook about his life. And you can see how these numbers reduce. The, the white went down to 0.02. It's almost a tenfold reduction. Uh, the blue went from 0.46 to 0.08 and the yellow to 0.16. So it was a great, there was a much more balancing uh, of those colors by giving him those colors and all of his symptoms disappeared. Uh, we also can put the color into different parts of the retina, and they have now found that the inferior or the nasal portions of your retina and your eye direct collect, uh, directly connect with the hypothalamus, which is your emotional uh, center for regulation. And in this person's uh, therapy, um, uh, they had very high numbers in the inferior, in the, in the nasal part of the retina. And, uh, at the end, uh, those numbers were greatly reduced, which indicated possibly that those parts of the retina that were connected to the hypothalamus were now receiving light properly. So, the, so uh, there's all these other applications I won't go into, but in terms of re we can use it to, to evaluate posture, the effect of lenses on the, on the nervous system and the pupil reflexes. Um, but is color receptivity uh, of these defects mean a lack of color? Uh, is it that we're opening our eyes? Maybe our eyes are just not responding to light because we want more of that color. So what's defined as the pupil not responding as a defect, maybe we're opening up because we want more of that color. Do we choose the colors that we need? Are there colors chosen according to acute and chronic problems, layers in the nervous system dysfunction? And do we need to progress until all colors are absorbed equally? So um, a couple of cases, uh, there was one with a severe head injury. Uh, they had blind spots in their visual field. Their eyes were not coordinating. They were going up and out. And uh, they were first treated with indigo and blue-green light until the pain went away. But after several weeks, uh, headaches were experienced, fatigued, increased spatial disorga disorganization uh, persisted, and we, re when we, re and we tested their pupils. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the defects were highest for, um, for uh, green and also for uh, blue and, uh, and yellow. So we again gave this person this yellow-blue filter, and after the end, all those colors, those defects showed tremendous reductions. And in the same time, all their eye problems became uh, lessened. So. Um, the idea is there's a number of these cases, but we take wherever the, the defects show the highest, and then we treat with those colors. And then as the pupils go down, we're measuring changes in their visual function, their peripheral vision, their eye coordination, their symptoms, and everything else. Um, but we also notice that other colors start to, get, start to show up as higher defects. And so we move on to another round of color, used, again, based on the pupil defects. And, uh, we used it also with, uh, with different kinds of cases of trauma. This is a case where somebody was normal, but they wanted to get rid of their reading glasses. We found that they had high, uh, high defects or faulty uh, perception for red and also for blue. And uh, they were given, uh, again, uh, in yellow, they were given the same kinds of colors and then moved on and given more colors. And no point in going through them all, but again, this person was their ability to focus at near at 57 years old was doubled. They were able to read without their reading glasses. 
Uh, there's another branch of, of therapy that instead of just giving specific colors, they believe in giving all the colors. Uh, two of these pioneers were Jacob Lieberman, uh, many of which you have heard of and know, and uh, the late John Searfoss, who treated with all colors until all colors, the person could look at all the colors and feel comfortable and that they could receive all the colors. So we use this, um, we used a device called a spectral illuminator, which allowed us to present one color every uh, 14 colors for, per minute, and uh, over a minute from uh, short wavelengths to long wavelengths. And we did this, we found also profound changes, not only in these, in these uh, numbers. Um, here's a patient that uh, had just had major so uh, shoulder surgery, he was in deep pain, um, chronic pain, and he measured in this uh, particular instances, uh, his white uh, field was 0.32, which is very high. Red was high, blue was high, yellow was high. All these colors, so it was like he was high in defects of all these colors. And we gave him all the colors, and you can see they greatly reduced. Uh, the white went from uh, 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 0.32 to 0.14, green, which was uh, 0.25, went to 0.06, blue went down, yellow went down and immediately he had a cessation of all the pain in his body left and he felt tremendous relief. And this was just after two treatments. So and there was another patient, same thing, uh, general fatigue under lots of stress. In this particular situation, the persons had multiple defects in all the colors or high numbers. They went down somewhat, but they were all still high. Yet the white, went down to zero, which meant there was a completely uh, a balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And that was the first time I had ever seen that in, in, in measuring over 100 patients, where the nervous system became, seemed to be totally balanced, again, by giving all the colors. So it's interesting that these outcomes uh, raise a lot of questions. Uh, there are colors that produce defects. Uh, are they showing a lack of receptivity? Are they, are they showing that they, uh, these colors are not are, are excessive, that we don't need these colors. Maybe we need the complementary colors. Um, we measure the latency of the pupil. The latency, the amplitude is how much the pupil changes its reflex. The latency is how long that takes. We find those lengths seem to not correlate directly either. And another thing that happens is defects move from one eye to the other eye. So, uh, you know, there's lots of... Uh, Lots of questions about it all. Um, and, you know, should certain colors be used? Should they be used in a sequence? Um, we see in trauma cases where there, we have to give people colors that palliate them, like blues and indigos, but later they still totally lack energy. And, and once they can accept and be comfortable with the blue colors, then we give them reds and, and yellow green colors to, to energize their body and then bring up their fatigue level. But it has to be done in a sequence over time. And only through doing this longer duration of treatment do we get really longer lasting results where there's not any uh, uh, regression. So this autonomic nervous system, as I spoke of earlier, is very complex. Treatment maybe is very complex, giving uh, and it says a lot for those of us in the room who always use all colors and have done that all along. Uh, it also means that, uh, you know, can we monitor our therapy using the pupil? I think we can. Um, or do we simply ask the patient which co colors are most comfortable, what feel the best? In fact, uh, Pierre gave a workshop on that, the, the last ILA, where we moved through a certain set of colors until they could accept the colors that really made them agitated. But as you move through these different colors, you can reach a certain level, a therapeutic level, that you can't by just prescribing one color or two colors. And then I guess the question is, does the organism seek the colors that heal itself and then, and then change the physiology to accept the colors? Um, can the light pipes that Anadi just talked about change and, and bring in those colors of, of us that we need? Does that whole system, those light pipes, change their, uh, their channels to give us the colors that we actually need? And uh, as that happens, does our perception of color changes that allows us to bring in new colors? So it's, uh, it's very complex, but it's very exciting to see this uh, to have this technology where we can start to look at what happens in real time when we give people light. And uh, the pupil reflexes are, are a new uh, frontier in this kind of uh, 
analysis, and it's exciting that uh, it will further our therapies even more, I'm sure, in time. And it gives us more, uh, I guess, uh, scientific validity to what we're doing as well. Oh, thank you. I'll turn it back over to Anadi. Yeah, Larry, so uh, this, uh, these studies you're doing very current here. It's really yes. what's uh, happening now. Right, 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 exciting. right. And so it's this new sensing device, this RAP or something, mm -hmm. that's really enabling you to quantify and measure in new ways. Right, yeah, to quantify, to quantify exactly in real time what the nervous system is doing to light. And, uh, you know, we take in light, but we also radiate light. And so, you know, you know the light of our eyes tells us a lot about what's going on inside. And uh, I think this is all another uh, step in that, uh, understanding that, those processes. All right. All right, thank you. <laughs> Could you wait after, Avram? Because it's um, it's quite a roller coaster. This uh, this presentation here. We're trying to give you an overview of many different things. It's not supposed to be an in-depth presentation, but more of a uh, just a taste of all kinds of new things happening. So I continue with a number of other interesting research going on. And some of it is done by ILA uh, members. For example, Abraham Heinier just published recently in the Philosophical Transactions uh, this article on uh, relation between light and the epigenome. So most likely he'll be telling us about this this afternoon. So very recent publication. <clears throat> Another recent publication by an ILA contributor is from Richard Hobday who uh, gave presentations uh, at a couple of ILA conferences. And uh, his article uh, relates to the um, impact of daylight on myopia in schools. It's, it's a major issue. For example, they now found out in China that, uh, I think it's somewhere here. Right, 80% of children in China now are myopic. It's, it's enormous numbers. And there is a relation between this and the light in the, the schools, daylight use. So there's a whole process, historical process, of how that, that has been seen and what's the current thoughts and what needs to change in this respect in this uh, review by Richard Abde. <clears throat> and this whole thing of daylighting technology is a hot topic among lighting designers and architects. They're trying more and more to optimize the use of daylight <clears throat> as a lighting source and move out from artificial light, which we know cause all kinds of uh, indirect problems. And uh, I was interested in, in uh, a talk I saw by a Canadian researcher, uh, Dr. Whitehead. He's at the British uh, Columbia University. <clears throat> and he's de developing systems to bring in daylight inside buildings but in technically optimized ways, not just simple windows uh, where sometimes the sun is not in the right direction and it fluctuates and it doesn't go very deep in buildings and so on. So he's creating technology that allows the optimization of this daylighting. And there's a very interesting uh, um, video presentation of, of his talk, uh, which you can find uh, on the web. And for example, this he, He's created a company called Sun Central, where they try to uh, uh, develop and market some of these instruments. So they have little arrays of moving mirrors that automatically track the sun in the day and focus the light on um, receptors. And they bring the light inside the building through light pipes. And they have special light pipes that gradually decrease in size so that the light gets distributed evenly throughout the, uh, the building. They said that it's a bit like plumbing, where you have to distribute water pressure across buildings. So they use ways to gradually decrease the pressure as it goes to the ends of the pipes. And they do the same with light. They, they have these light pipes that gradually uh, decrease. So the, the light is equally brought up to 50 meters deep inside buildings. And I think there's a picture here. Yeah, here you can see the result. This daylight coming up 
and it's, it's very beautiful lighting. People in these offices uh, feel much better than under neon lights and, and other sources. So it's an interesting example of uh, technology that's uh, being created now. <clears throat> Moving on to a completely different subject. Um, an article that I saw that I found really fascinating, of course, working with colors. Because when you work with colors for many years, as many of us are doing, we, we, also, we are fascinated by every single color of the spectrum. But after so many years, uh, at least personally, uh, I have this experience that I kind of wish there could be even more new colors that I dream of seeing. Sometimes in dreams, we perceive colors that we don't even see in the physical plane. So we, there's this desire to see new colors. And actually, uh, a team of researchers uh, in the US um, had this uh, article, it was in the Scientific American, where they described how they enable people to see a completely new color. I found this uh, fascinating. And um, to understand this, you have to go back to one of the basic theories of color vision, uh, dating back to the, the end of the 19th century. It was Ewald Ehring who proposed this theory, which has been accepted and is used still today that actually our color processing, we have cones in the retina that perceive three uh, main spectrum parts, uh, red, green, and blue. But there is processing somewhere, it's not exactly known where, whether it's in the retina or in the brain or somewhere, that uh, combines these three basic signals, red, blue, and green, primary signals, into pairs of opponent colors. Uh, red and green are opponent, and blue and yellow are opponent. The yellow is a combination of the green and red. So in our visual system, there is this opponency um, between, I think we see it here, yes, uh, between bl uh, blue and yellow and red and green. So you cannot see both of these colors together. You see either one or the other. But because our perception is actually a combination of signals from these, you can never see both at the same time. And their experiment was to enable somebody precisely to do that, to see both yellow and blue at the same time. And uh, it's not like you, you would think if you mix those two colors, you'll get something greenish. But uh, we're talking about something completely different. The, the, you can actually see at the border between those two, a completely unknown color that is not blue, uh, not blue, not yellow, but somewhere both of them. So it's an experience we don't normally have. And the way they managed to do this, it's not simple. Uh, they need a system where they track the vision uh, of the, the person, so they have a tracker, so they can create an image that's completely stabilized with your vision field. <coughs> And they have to take great care to equalize the luminance of each half, otherwise it doesn't work. And when they do this carefully, then they create this kind of um, illusion on the optical system where you can perceive an unknown color. Quite fascinating. Um, moving on to another uh, subject. Um, this year I discovered um, a light healing system that I uh, had never heard about. It's quite remarkable to see that there are these light healing modalities happening uh, which are completely unknown because it's small groups of people working in their own country and sometimes there is not much communication and the information does not spread. So uh, it's again an example of what we can achieve at the ILA. That this group of person heard about the ILA and contacted us and so we are able to discover and share this a uh, new healing light uh, modality. And it's the group of uh, Professor Magnin in France who developed what he calls photonic medicine. Uh, there's this book that, uh, they, they, that came out uh, quite recently. And actually, uh, Dr. Vidal is right here with us. Uh, and he came for the conference. And I'll just very briefly describe what, what it is. Uh, we, we, of course, cannot go in depth. But um, from what I understand, uh, Professor Magnin uh, his, his technique is derived from uh, Paul Nogier uh, auricular medicine. So it's the use of specific points on, in the ear that are tied to the um, reproduction of the uh, acupuncture system 
but mapped in the ear. And you will focus different colors on different points in the ear. And I think it goes further than this, but it's, it's a, a brief uh, introduction. And um, so this is one example, for example, of the mapping of the different areas of the body in the ear lobe. So there's a whole uh, sophisticated system developed by uh, Nogier that maps this, and it's being used in different healing modalities. And they use uh, the Terralite, which is an instrument focusing different colors through fiber optics, so they can apply uh, tiny points of colors to these different ear areas. And um, the interesting research that uh, I wanted to bring out uh, today, which is in that book, was a study conducted by Dr. Ruxville. Um, and it's one of the example, the most striking example I've seen of actually establishing uh, that different colors have a different effect on the autonomous nervous system. It's not so easy to uh, establish this. As uh, Larry knows um, in previous studies, and I also, we've done a clinical study uh, recently where we try to see the effects of colors and the autonomic <coughs> nervous system. And it, the, re the effect is not clear cut. We never get this simple effect of uh, red light stimulating the sympathetic and blue light stimulating the parasympathetic. Um, <clears throat> so I found it interesting that this, uh, this study got very clear cut the result. Oops, sorry. Going a little too fast here. Um, they got very clear activation of um, sympathetic <coughs> through warm colors and parasympathetic, parasympathetic through cool colors. And it seems that the reason that they were able to get these clear results is that they have a way to actually identify which points they should measure. Because again, it's a complex system and it's different for each one of us. But with their technique, using the vascular, um, uh, how, how do you call it, the VAS? Yes, vascular autonomic signal. Right, you can get a feedback from the body when you use uh, colors. So they were able to detect for each specific person which points were active in their physiology at any given time. And so they focus their tests on those points, which are the active ones. And this is where probably you can remove the noise from the signal and you start to get this clear picture emerging. So an interesting research there, it was conducting, uh, conducted over um, 100 uh, people in uh, recent years, 2010, 2012. Um, and now to end, um, there's not that many studies uh, pertaining to the energetic modality of light therapy. There's thousands and thousands pertaining to the biophysical modality as we saw, but things related to the energetic modality are, are uh, few and far in between. So um, this last one from uh, uh, Ruxville was an example, and here is a hint at uh, what the future holds. This is an, uh, one of the very latest scientific American uh, magazine in, in March this year. Um, they talked about um, a bioelectric stimulation and uh, they're starting to find out that they can directly um, intercept the nervous signals traveling from the brain to the body uh, by tapping into nerves and so they are injecting um, electrical signals there that kind of mimic the signals that the brain produces. There is a const constant feedback between different sensing organs in the body and the brain. And, and it's part of the homeostasis that this is an equilibrium. So there is an exchange between the, the very physical um, the sensors and the more mental, non-physical things going on in the brain, the brain reaction. And it's what, uh, what's being called mind over immunity. They're, they're finding out that uh, mind has a direct impact on the, the um, immunity of our bodies. And that there's a constant feedback between the, uh, the immune system, all the various cells com um, that compose the immune system and what's happening in the brain. Um, and the, the reason I mentioned this is that 
I think it's one of the first examples where we see that we can control the body through information, through signals that are put in the system. So we're not anymore trying to influence the system to drugs through biochemical means, but we're starting to be able to try to influence it through informational means, through uh, um, patterns of information. In this case, it is with electrical signals. And in this case, it's very gross. <clears throat> it's just, um, it's the very beginning of this new science where we are, um, it's a little, uh, I feel it's a bit like comparing uh, a Beethoven symphony, which is incredibly complex combinations of frequencies that evoke deep emotions in us, and comparing that to a sine tone generator, which gives a very gross signal, just pure energy, but no information content. So the science in this field is pretty much at this stage. We're working with sine waves, very rough, uh, broad signals. So, and still that manages to have an effect on the body. But we can imagine what will happen when we learn more and we can start to generate signals that are much more sophisticated and in tune with what we are trying to affect. And uh, this is being done, uh, starting to be done with electrical impulses. Uh, but, of course, as we know, it can be done with light also. There is a transduction between light and the nervous system. So we can imagine how through light uh, we can start to act on the immune system and the whole uh, homeostasis, uh, as we do commonly through our techniques. But uh, even the mainstream medical world is uh, gradually going in that direction. Uh, for example, these uh, bioelectricity systems, <coughs> major drug companies, are now investing millions of dollars into this kind of technology. So they are themselves gradually shifting towards this informational way of dealing with health. <coughs> Very reluctantly, but they are gradually doing it. <laughs> and, um, oh yes, I wanted to finish uh, with this. Um, yeah, in relation with light and how it, it uh, can spread throughout the whole system through this information uh, uh, transference. And this is taken from uh, uh, May Wan Ho's research. As you know, May, Dr. May Wan Ho was supposed to talk at this conference, uh, but we were very sorry when she had to cancel at the last minute through uh, uh, unforeseen uh, circumstances. Uh, but what she um, is establishing is, and what actually Gerald um, uh, shared with us this morning in uh, a very beautiful way, is that our whole body is basically a liquid crystal with this water, structured water in us, uh, creating channels where information can, can flow, uh, both electronic and photonic. And uh, these are very beautiful pictures that uh, Mei Wan Ho created uh, through uh, interferometric uh, um, displays where you can see that light reflected, this is a worm here, a larva, uh, creates these beautiful patterns. And this can only happen if the living structure is highly coherent. Otherwise, you wouldn't get these interference patterns. So this is a, a beautiful technique to show how life is actually an incredible uh, structuring, coherent structuring of all the cells within us, and how um, these exquisite and very balanced structures are sensitive and open to the most subtle energy levels, far below what's needed, for example, for thermal excitation or very rough energies, which is what is being studied uh, mostly by um, um, regular science. So we, we are not talking of working with energy levels which are orders of magnitude uh, more subtle than these. And this is where the future of uh, medicine lies. And that's what I had for you today, yeah. <laughs>